Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's 2018 Fall Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University, and Amy Stone from Ohio State University. We welcome you to our webinar today entitled Update on Asian Longhorned Beetle. Our presenter today is Dr. Philip Baldoff, who has been with the USDA Project Manager for the Asian Longhorn Beetle Eradication Project in Ohio since April of 2012. Philip came to the ALB program from the Avica Work Unit in Western New York where he supervised and participated in a wide range of active programs like emerald ash borer, golden nematode, gypsy moth, export certification, and import inspection, to name a few. Before his time in New York, Philip worked on the pale cyst nematode program in Idaho Falls, Idaho, as a supervisor and an officer. Prior to beginning his career with the USDA, Philip earned his PhD from Cornell University in plant pathology by researching potato viruses. He earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Maryland in College Park in general biology and an AS from Ricks College, which is now Brigham Young University, Idaho, in Rexburg, Idaho in ecology and wildlife management. Before we get started today, please know that we welcome your comments and questions please type them in the, in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. Okay. Um, Philip will respond to the questions and comments after the webinar. So to keep these free webinars coming, we're gonna need your feedback. After the webinar, you will be emailed a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that I hope you will be take the time to fill out. And if you're one of the first 10 to fill out the survey, you will get an EAB goodie bag. For those who, of you wanting CEUs and CCH credits, I will be sending you information on how to obtain these in the aforementioned email. The, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info. You will find, also find recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today. And for university. please uh, begin your presentation, Philip. Just need to unmute, unmute your mic. There you go. Thank you, Robin, and, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, first, let me start off by kind of giving everybody an introduction to who some of the, the, the main players are with, within the Asian Longhorn Beetle Program. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Paul Shalou. Uh, he is the Asian Longhorn Beetle National Policy Manager. He used to be the Emerald Dash Borer National Policy Manager. Uh, Josie Ryan is the National Field Operations Manager and Scott Fister is our science and technology uh, guru. And all three of them together make up the Asian Longhorn Beetle Cross-Functional Working Group. Um, each state with the current and active Asian longhorn beetle uh, infestation has a dedicated eradication program. Um, in New York, Anthony Massup is the program director in the acting capacity. Eddie Chen used to be the New York program director. He has since been promoted and he's now the New York state plant health director. And uh, and they're both federal staff. They work with uh, folks um, that work for NISDAM or New York State Department of Ag and Markets um, as a close cooperator. 
a, it's a similar relationship in, in all the states. So in Massachusetts, there's a program director, Ryan Vasquez, state plant health director, Kate Aikenhead, and they work closely with the Massachusetts Department of Ag Agricultural Resources, as well as the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. And then in Ohio, um, Bill Baldoff, that's me. I am the program director uh, in Ohio on the federal side. John Birch is my boss. He's the state plant health director for Ohio. And then we, our close cooperators are the Ohio Department of Agriculture and the Ohio Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> um, to give you a, a broad picture of the Asian longhorn beetle infestations in North America, the first detection was in New York, uh, New York City, uh, Brooklyn to be more precise, uh, followed by Chicago, Illinois, then New Jersey, then Ontario, Canada, followed by Massachusetts, and then Ohio. A thing to point out on this map is um, the white dots, or the white squares, I should say, indicate uh, infestation, Asian longhorn beetle infestations that have been eradicated. The red squares indicate Asian longhorn beetle infestations that are still active. Um, so you can see that the uh, Chicago, New Jersey, Ontario, and Boston, Massachusetts infestations have been eradicated and, and efforts are still underway in New York, Massachusetts, Massachusetts and Ohio, as well as Canada. Another thing to point out on this map, the uh, yellow visible on the background represents uh, maple forests. And um, I'll present some data later on that uh, make it pretty easy to understand how important that can be because maple is by far and away the primary or preferred host of Asian longhorn beetle. Um, so if, if Asian longhorn beetle were allowed to escape, um, Asian longhorn beetle would be able to multiply and, and spread uh, for a long time and cover a wide area. So, the tree types that ALB can complete its life cycle on are called host trees. Uh, in the United States, um, the known ALB host trees include all species of the following 12 types of trees or, or genera, ash, birch, elm, golden rain tree, London plane tree or sycamore, maple, horse chestnut or buckeye, Katsura, mimosa, mountain ash, poplar, and willow. Uh, ALB um, does go through complete metamorphosis. Um, ALB female adults lay eggs just underneath the bark. Those eggs hatch and uh, larva um, begin feeding uh, in the phloem area and they molt several times and eventually become uh, or, or they pupate um, before emerging as an adult Asian longhorn beetle after a minimum of 887 growing degree days. Uh, after mating, the uh, Asian longhorn beetle adult female will chew egg sites or oviposition sites into host trees and deposit an egg, uh, one egg per oviposition site. Um, when we go out and survey looking for signs of Asian longhorn beetle infestation, most of the time we'll find these egg sites. Um, you know, there are lots of uh, different things that can cause holes in trees, but these egg sites uh, are a bit unique. 
um, and we look for the mandible or, or chewing scars left behind um, on the edges of those egg sites, uh, which is a little bit more definitive for, for the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this tree was found in New Jersey. It had over 800 exit holes. It's a red maple. And the, it was estimated to, the infestation was estimated to be there about seven years. Um, you can see there's a warehouse in the background of the, of the picture that is the probable point of origin, uh, presumably from, from international uh, shipping from Asia. The goods were made with um, infested, or the, sorry, the wood packaging material was made with infested material um, and ALB was able to emerge and start a new infestation. That's all uh, conjecture at this point, but that is the likely uh, introduction. <clears throat> and, and just by way, uh, this is, uh, that tree did die um, in evidence that Asian longhorn beetle does kill uh, host trees, can and does kill host trees. So as the larva feed, they form tunnels or what we call galleries in the tree uh, trunks and branches. If you have a fallen branch or a cutting wood, you may see that tunneling on, on the inside. Uh, Sawdust-like material called frass from the insects burrowing can be found at the trunk uh, and the branch bases of infested trees too. And you can see some frass packed into those galleries. Uh, in, in some of these images. <clears throat> From pupae, we, we already kind of briefly went over this. Um, adult beetles emerge. Um, that hap or begins in the uh, warmer months of spring and summer, and they chew their way out of the tree. Uh, the top picture on the right is an adult, a close up of an adult chewing uh, its way out of the tree. Uh, the picture on the bottom left uh, is an adult uh, also on its way out of an exit hole. Um, I want to now zoom in a little bit on each infestation to give kind of uh, an update as to where we're at. I'll first start in New York since that is where Asian longhorn beetle was first detected in the United States. So currently, there are uh, 111 square miles regulated. There are, uh, there have been 7,146 uh, infested trees detected since 1996, when it was first detected in Brooklyn. Uh, the infest, there has been an infestation in Islip. Uh, that infestation uh, was eradicated, declared eradicated in 2011. Um, the infestations in Staten Island and Manhattan were both declared eradicated in 2013. Um, Eastern Queens was deregulated in 2017, last year. And as indicated in the, in the red, border. Uh, there are active infestations um, still in the uh, Brooklyn and Western Queens as well as Central Long Island. And there have been recent um, detections even in the Amityville area in, Central, uh, in the Central Long Island infestation. The last infested tree uh, detection in Brooklyn was in 2010. Uh, staff there and contractors are currently addressing a large number of callbacks. So um, in New York State, they need property owner permission to enter a property and inspect. 
Um, and sometimes that's not the easiest. So uh, a main work going now is to, to clear those callbacks, to get into those properties, to do those inspections and confirm that ALB is no longer there. Um, once it, once those callbacks are, are cleared, then the, that will clear the way for the eradication uh, declaration in those, in those areas. So um, in 2013, there were 295 infested trees detected in central Long Island. Um, in 2014, there were uh, 367. 2015, there were 113. 2016, there were 12. 2017, there were 43. And there were 20 trees so far uh, detected in 2018. So the trend is in, in the right direction. We're working towards uh, declaring eradication in, in central Long Island, and uh, they're well on their way to, to getting there. So um, in 1996 through 2008, uh, there were 6,212 infested tree detections. We kind of grouped all those years, all the data from all those years together in that one bar on the left. <clears throat> um, in 2008, there were 75, 2009, seven, 2010, two, zero in 2011 and 2012. And uh, those 2013 through 2018 data points are the same ones I already, already mentioned. <clears throat> so in this next slide, it's going to present the same data shown here. <clears throat> Just the only difference is lopping off that, that first bar. So it zeroes in on 2008 through 2018. Just, just so you can see that uh, more recent data a little bit more clearly. With that, I will move on to uh, some Massachusetts uh, details, give you an update on the program and the progress there. So Asian longhorn beetle was first detected in, in Worcester, Massachusetts in 2008. And then again in Boston in 2010. Boston was a small infestation they only uh, detected six trees that were infested, and uh, it was eradicated from Boston in 2000, declared eradication in Boston in 2014. There are over 24,000 infested trees. There have been over 24,000 infested trees detected in East Worcester. Uh, since 2008. They've removed over 36,000 36, uh, trees there. That includes all the infested trees plus um, high risk host trees or trees where Asian lungwort beetle wasn't necessarily detected, but due to proximity, um, they were deemed risky enough that that they took down those high-risk host trees as well. Um, and they have replanted over 50,000 trees in, in, in the Worcester infestation. Uh, this data is similar to that displayed for New York earlier. Uh, the one thing to point out here is is the continued downward trend of infested tree detections. Uh, I believe this is another example of the hard work from the cooperative program uh, and the stakeholders and that, that all have contributed over the years. Um, another thing to note here, the data for 2008 is uh, they were only doing survey from August to December 
of 2008. So that those detections were only for five months and not the full year. So in 2014, there, um, there, uh, so more recent uh, than closer to today, 2014, there were 627 detections. 2015, 230. 2016, 112. 2017, there were 59. And to date in 2018, zero. They haven't had any detections. Of course, uh, you have to be looking um, in order to detect. They are looking in, in Massachusetts. They have the survey crews out in full force, but it depends on where they're looking to, um, as is the case with any investigation. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that they're not ready to declare to declare eradication in in Worcester. Um, because they got to look everywhere, and sometimes multiple times. Data for this slide is for all infested trees from 2008 to February 2017. Um, and, and I already kind of alluded to this earlier in the presentation, but 98% of the infested trees detected are maple. You can see the first uh, five bars there on the left are all different species of maple trees. Norway maple in, uh, in Worcester has for the first time just recently moved ahead of red maple as the preferred host, host species. That may be simply due to the fact that Norways are the dominant urban and suburban tree there in, in those environments, um, with red maple being a ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous in the, in the rural areas. This slide shows uh, negative host trees. So trees that get surveyed and no signs of ALB are detected. Um, by far and away, the uh, most common trees surveyed there in Worcester are red maples. Um, and overall, the chart represents 4,201,800 874 tree surveys, which if any of you have done tree surveys represents a lot of work. Um, tree species beyond gray birch on, on the chart, so to the right of gray birch, represent less than 1% of all the trees that they've surveyed. Level three surveys, so these are surveys greater than a mile and a half away from any known infestation and are typically done due to some regulatory concern, um, whether it's a, a lumber mill or a campground or something like that, a, an area that could be considered a higher risk just due to the movement of, of host material um, are underway in Massachusetts as in all the, the quarantined areas. Um, they get ranked as far as priority and, and uh, by risk and the highest are firewood processing facilities. Um, there are followed by wood storage and disposal yards, uh, and then vehicle storage locations where crews might be parking their vehicles overnight uh, that are full of, of regulated material. <clears throat> and, and then after kind of going through that analysis, they'll ask, ask a question, um, 
if they've worked in the regulated area or not, and if they have that that. Uh, and, and based on how frequently that kind of would raise the priority as well. So this uh, is kind of a, some data that relates to that previous slide. So um, the number of service calls, uh, for example, if somebody called into the office and said, hey, I think my tree's sick or hey, my neighbor works in the regulated area and, and I think he brought some wood home the other day. Can you come check it out? Those are the types of service calls um, that would go into the data that's presented here. Um, and, you know, it's a lot. We have dedicated teams that go out and respond to the, each and every service call. Um, you know, we want to encourage these types of calls um, because there is a chance that one of these calls might actually reveal an, infest an infestation. So we want to uh, do whatever we can to promote these kind of calls. So we go and respond and, and, and thank profusely the, those who uh, submit calls. Um, even if they are wrong, we don't try to make anybody feel stupid for for calling in uh, something that is not Asian longhorn beetle that is uh, counterproductive. In addition to uh, visual surveys that are done with uh, by our staff with binoculars or climbers, we have several other tools that we use to supplement our eradication efforts. Uh, one of these is pheromone trapping. Um, while we have only caught a handful of beetles and traps, those interceptions, at least in, in Massachusetts, have led the teams to discover infestations within the regula regulated area that were not scheduled to be surveyed for a number of years. So in a way, they, they have been helpful for us. Now I want to uh, transition to uh, talk about Ohio. <clears throat> uh, Asian longhorn beetle was first detected in, in the summer of 2011. A property owner reported it uh, uh, and it, it got back uh, to APHIS who confirmed it in June of 2011. Currently there are 57 square miles uh, that are regulated as shown in the red border. There have been 19,066 infested trees detected to date and almost 3,000 trees replanted. The uh, Batavia Stonelick Township quarantine um, only had three infested trees detected. Uh, those trees were removed, uh, chemical treatments were applied in that area, and we just recently uh, were able to deregulate that quarantine in March of this year. The Tate Township uh, regulated area is still active. Um, that's the largest area shown in the red border. In fact, we uh, expanded that quarantine last year, about a year and a half ago, uh, due to a detection just outside of the uh, perimeter of what was then the uh, infestation boundary. And we had to expand it into the uh, East Fork wildlife area, which I think you might be able to see if I mouse over here on the right side. So this area that I'm mousing over currently is where the expansion took place. Uh, the Monroe Township uh, quarantine is the smallest of, a, of the three quarantines we've had in, in Ohio. That was also deregulated this year, just, just last month, um, September 12th. 
there were uh, 48 infested trees detected there in total. Um, but we took the similar approach to what we did in the Davia Stelnik uh, Township quarantine and we were able to declare eradication there. Uh, this graph shows the Asian lungworm beetle infested tree detections um, in Ohio. It hasn't been such a downward trend as it was in Massachusetts, but again, and, and I kind of alluded to this, uh, it depends, not only does it depend on, on the number of infested trees out there, but it also depends on where you're looking. Um, so we, uh, in for example, in 2014, we sent crews back into the area of most heavily infested, the most heavily infested area that had already been surveyed once. We sent them back there in 2014, which is why the numbers spiked again. Um, and that spike, same kind of spike may happen as crews go back into that same area again. Um, but as of late, that has not occurred, and, and we've seen the drastic uh, negative trend towards zero. And, and in 2018, so far, we've only had 14 uh, detections. And uh, similar to Massachusetts, 98.6% of all the infested trees are maple. maple. Um, and in Ohio, by far and away, the um, most prevalent infested tree are red maples. Those are also the most prevalent tree, tree in, in, in general in, in the quarantine area. Uh, red maple, many of you might be aware, a, a nickname of red maple is swamp maple. Um, and the Claremont County infestation um, covers a lot of swamp land and red maple is uh, very prevalent in those swampy areas. There is an ongoing ALB treatment research study. The goal of that study is to determine um, if a small scale treatment application can be effective in the eradication effort. Uh, typically the, the treatments that have uh, been conducted to date have been large scale, uh, cover wide swaths of land, or we treat all the host trees. Um, this study is to try to see if we could potentially avoid treating uh, wide swaths and just uh, keeping those treatments more local, uh, localized. Uh, the red dots um, all represent different areas that were part of the study. The, uh, the, dairy, the, the treatment areas indicated with, in, uh, by the black lines, uh, the treatments were conducted in the spring. The red lines, the treatments were conducted in the fall, have been conducted in the fall. And the yellow lines are, are control uh, plots. So we do those treatments. Um, and then as we survey post-treatment, we're looking for uh, signs of infestation. and um, and so far, we, the only infestation that we've found is in that uh, the dot labeled I on the map. Uh, we did find the infestation. It was not in the treatment area, but it was in that zone of, of that treatment area. Um, now I want to shift gears again and talk about some uh, national ALB program initiatives. First. Um, I want to start out uh, by talking about risk, matter, uh, risk models, our, our risk assessment effort. <clears throat> this has been in collaboration with the uh, United States Forest Service. Um, when the delimitation survey in Massachusetts was, uh, when the first round of delimitation was, survey was reached in, in Massachusetts, they had a complete data set and a relatively good idea of infestation or infested locations. The goal of the model was uh, not to be predictive of where the beetle could go next, 
but rather tell us the likelihood of where the beetle could be currently. Um, they initially used uh, a 200 meter uh, buffer from every infestation uh, because 50% of all beetles emerging from trees are expected to disperse within 200, 250 meters of a tree. Uh, therefore, the highest probability of finding beetles emerging from a given tree is within 200 meter, meters. Uh, they've since uh, shrunk that down. They're now using 100 meter rasters, uh, which allows for more precision uh, in our response planning. There, there are, are a couple outliers um, in the southwest and southeast part of the Worcester regulated area. Um, but those are outliers because they are traced back to the movement of firewood and, or uh, wood debris from the pesticides and not due to natural dispersal of the beetle. Uh, a similar effort has been uh, done to um, assess the risk in Ohio. Um, and similar to what I just described in Massachusetts, the, the two satellite quarantines in the Batavia Stonelick area, as well as in Monroe, um, those are, have been treated as separate introductions because those infestations uh, were most likely initiated by the movement of infested material uh, or infested firewood. Um, and not due to the beetle dis dispersing uh, naturally in uh, by, by flight. So in, in application, um, the final product, so to speak, is, is shown on the right-hand side. Um, everything in green on that right-hand side map uh, has been has been surveyed and they use the map on the left to kind of guide that survey uh, on the right, uh, targeting the, the highest risk areas. <clears throat> the drive to um, create this next model, this uh, dispersion um, model came from the need for a better way to make decisions with uh, limited resources. You know, if we had unlimited resources, we could cut every host tree down for 100 miles or place one surveyor at each tree um, in the quarantine zone and have them sit there 24 hours a day scanning for signs of ALD. Obviously, we don't have unlimited resources. So we have to use what resources we do have in the most efficient manner. Uh, instead of just planning to survey 1.5 miles out from any known infested tree, we want, we want to strategically place our staff and work towards a consistent goal, or in other words, uh, to within a confidence level. Um, so we want to go, we want to direct our surveys um, in a less reactive uh, and more directed um, method. And this type of approach is even more important in larger quarantines. Um, like the one in Massachusetts, which is double the size of the um, quarantine zone in, in Ohio. And so, you know, it's all about time. If we have reduced time uh, to get a quicker detection, we're able to mitigate the risk uh, quicker um, when we have the resources available. And so we partnered with the U US Forest Service and pulling in some of our very talented USDA and state staff, we were able to develop this dispersion risk model. Uh, we reviewed all, all current published data and our unpublished data. And in this model, the assumption is that there's um, a one to 20 ratio of dispersion. So in other words, 5% of the beetles exiting a tree will disperse. Um, that is, they will leave the tree of their origin. The, and the estimate uh, with the rest of the beetles remaining on the tree of origin. And then 50% of all the emerging beetles based on the dispersion model above are expected to stay within 200 and 250 meters of, of the tree they emerge from. 
The curves represent differing numbers of dispersing beetles and predict that the more dispersing beetles you have, the higher risk you have further from the point of infestation. <clears throat> so in Massachusetts, they use this to uh, direct their survey work. So on this map and, and following that same um, curve here, Boy 917 is a, is a unit where they've been surveying in Boylston. Um, the assumption is that three dispersing beetles um, will, uh, will, will emerge from the 60 in total exit holes they found in that, in that area. Um, and after they've done the survey, they would have detected all those, all those sites. And running the same model assumption on the second cluster of infested trees shown on the right, um, it would, or, or when they're doing the survey, uh, because of the cluster on the left, they will detect this, uh, the other cluster uh, shown on the right. And they can also use this uh, risk model to determine how they're gonna survey, whether it's, um, with the ground surveyors or the aerial tree climbers, with the aerial tree climbers being considered more of a precision tool, um, more likely to detect uh, low infestations. Whereas the ground crews, um, as you can probably imagine, aren't able to see as much of the tree and are therefore less likely to detect all uh, points of infestation. So we're currently working on improvements to the field data collection. So we use pan currently are using Panasonic tough pads. You find infested trees, you input the lat and long and the level of infestation. And then in theory, the, an algorithm will calculate the risk in that immediate area and tell you how far out you need to survey <coughs> uh, to hit the highest risk areas. It should also be said that all the areas will, will eventually get surveyed, but again, due to limited resources, we, we want to put our surveyors in the highest risk areas. Um, this and these same tools that we've just been talking about um, are going to be spread. You know, it, these kind of uh, these kind of tools can be used uh, for risk assessment assessments with other uh, pests like the spotted lantern fly and the European cherry uh, fruit fly. Some other uh, national initiatives uh, currently underway. Um, we are currently in the process of, of trying to determine the efficacy of using uh, unmanned aerial systems that have uh, cameras mounted and zoom capable uh, cameras on there. Uh, we can detect high quality photos and videos uh, to determine if trees are infested without sending a climber up there. Um, our climbers do a great job, but it is risky sending climbers up trees. And, and if there are cases where we can uh, dedicate climbers in, in other areas, higher priority and, and not necessarily pull them down from a tree to have them go check a suspicious tree. Um, I would rather do that. Uh, we just had a test flight recently uh, here in Ohio. This was the second time we've had a test flight. That's me on the right, by the way. I'm wearing a, a goggles or a headset that um, the camera is beamed right to that headset. Uh, it's designed to block out um, ambient light so that I can have a better view of what the camera is seeing when, it, when that UAS is, is flying up next to a tree looking for areas of AOB damage. Um, this just kind of helps you understand how, how good that camera is. 
the the picture on the left um, is a shot from the UAS looking down at the ground. You can kind of see a small uh, white round thing in the middle of that image. When that UAS camera zoomed in on that white image, it was actually a hat on the ground, and you can see how clearly you can see the, the hat on the right with the zoom. Some other initiatives that are currently underway with the program. Uh, there are ALB trained or canines that are trained to detect uh, frass that's produced from Asian longhorn beetle. They were brought out to both programs. Uh, the dogs can definitely detect ALB. The problem is, is that when you bring a dog into a wood lot and there's infestation everywhere, uh, I think there was a little bit of sensory overload and they weren't able to pin, pinpoint infested trees. So there is, um, I'm not saying that dogs uh, cannot be effective in, in an eradication program. In fact, they might be very helpful, especially when there's a light infestation where only one or a small number of trees are infested and you're trying to determine if you should dedicate your survey team to that woodlot versus another woodlot. You know, if the dog responded to a, a tree in, in one woodlot, that might raise the, uh, the priority on, on, on that woodlot and so you would send survey teams there sooner than the woodlot where a, a canine did not respond. And uh, there's a lot more that I could tell you about, but I believe I am out of uh, time for today's webinar. There are lots of other resources out there where you can go. Um, you might want to start with AsianLonghornBeetle.com. There's lots of good information there. There's also a reporting tool there. So if, uh, if somebody were to see a tree that had suspicious uh, signs of ALB damage on them. Um, they can take a picture and they can upload that picture there at that site and also include other uh, important information about that. Those reports get sent to the closest regulatory official who can then uh, follow up on those reports. Uh, the APHIS website has uh, dedicated ALB information as well as several other social media outlets um, where you can get lots of information, lots of good information out there. And with that, I'll uh, open it up for questions. Oh, uh, we have one question. Um, Joseph Atkins asks, sorry, this is off topic, but what is the make and model of that drone with the visor? Do you fly it yourself? There are so many potential applications for that. So, um, unfortunately, I don't know that. We, uh, a company named M3 um, built that specifically, that particular model specifically for us. It's made to uh, be able to interchange components easily, quickly and easily, based off of the conditions or, or anything else. Um, and it's kind of a custom, custom build uh, specifically for, for ALB. Um, the, the headset uh, option, I think, isn't unique to, to that custom build, though. I think that's a feature that you could get with with uh, other models and camera setups. Uh, the funding for that, by the way, came from a, a farm bill, uh, farm bill grant. Okay. Um, Michael Jenkins asks, in, in the treatment test to eradicate ALB, what products or techniques were used as treatment? So it was all imidacloprid uh, trunk injection. Uh, we are unable to use uh, soil injection or, or soil drench methods here just due to the um, 
high density of, of trees that need to be treated um, with, with the trunk inject, or sorry, with the soil injection, injection and uh, soil drench methods. They have, uh, the labels have limits on the amount of uh, pesticides that can be applied in a, in a specific area. So we would exceed those areas or those limits if we if we use those methods. So it's all trunk injection using all red. All right. How much of a problem do you think ALB would be in an area with a low population of maple but a high population of other host plants like willow? Do you know if there are any climate constraints for ALB? Um, E.g., do you think it would be an issue somewhere colder, like the Rocky Mountains, or warmer, like Virginia? I don't think the cold bothers ALB much at all. I, th I think what would happen there, ALB could still establish an infestation. It might have a longer um, uh, time between the egg laying and an adult beetle emerging. Um, you know, in warmer climates, uh, the, the emergence can occur in one to two years. In colder climates, it might be two to three or, or even longer. So I don't think the cold is, is going to impact the insect. It might impact the rate of spread of the infestation, though, of course, which, which is a good thing. So yes, I do think a, an infestation could get established in, in colder climates, like at the Rockies. Um, there, I think there are other parts of that question, though, that I might have uh, not answered. Can you repeat it, Robin? Sure. Um, how much of a problem do you think ALB would be in an area of, with a low population of maple, but a high population of the other host plants like willow? Oh, so once again, uh, willow is a host of ALB. ALB can, can reproduce in willow. We have we have infested willows with exit holes here in Ohio, even, and ALB could could thrive in that environment. Um, maybe not as well as uh, uh, an environment dominated by maples, but it certainly could could spread and and cause the, the same type of damage. Okay. What is the general cost of chemical treatment of host trees, and is it more or less effective than survey and removal of infested trees? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the, it, it's a hard question to answer um, because it's not just the cost of the chemical or the cost of the application that has to be considered. In addition to the cost of the application of the chemical, what has to be considered is if it's 100% effective um, at, at killing all the, the ALB uh, in, in that tree or that might, um, that might feed on that tree or that might lay eggs in that tree. And, and if it's not 100% effective, um, that could prolong the, the eradication time period. Um, so our program would, would thus be around longer um, and all the expenses and the budget required to run the program would be around longer. So if you just look at the, the cost of applying the chemical itself versus to, to treat a particular tree versus the cost of removing that tree, Applying the chemical is cheaper, but the overall cost of conducting chemical treatments versus removals, it's, it's not the easiest figure to, to come up with. And it, it's only estimates, but we have always taken the more conservative approach at removing infested trees uh, in the eradication effort. Okay, do you know if trees ever survive ALB infestations either here or in their home range? Uh, so I do know that ALB kills trees. 
um, we have seen trees that have been killed by ALB. But as soon as we know about a tree that's infested, we remove it. So we don't let it, we don't let the infestation linger um, to see if that tree could ever re recover or any tree could recover. So that, that's another one, a hard one to, um, to answer. Now, the way that the Asian long arm beetle kills trees is, is different from, for example, how the emerald ash borer kills trees. Um, and if you're more familiar with emerald ash borer, you know, the larva feeding in ash trees from emerald ash borer, they, they essentially girdle the tree, leading to a rapid, a rapid demise of any uh, EAB infested ash tree. <clears throat> Asian long beetle doesn't kill trees that way. Uh, the feeding galleries, the internal feeding galleries caused by the larval uh, feeding essentially weakens the, weakens the structural integrity of the tree um, so that when a windstorm or an ice storm or a heavy snow comes along, um, branches break, branches fall, and there's not enough uh, photosynthase produced to um, keep to nourish that tree and and keep it alive. That process takes years to occur, uh, and and so you know a lot of times you know we we tell a property owner, hey, your tree's infested with Asian longhorn beetle, and and you look up at the canopy and it still looks full and still looks like a beautiful, healthy tree. Um, we've never let that tree stand long enough to see if, if it indeed it could withstand an infestation. But we've seen it enough that to know that Asian longer beetle does kill trees. Um, so we, again, take the conservative approach and, and remove any infested tree. Okay. Uh, Joseph Adkins asked, do you fear this return, I'm sorry, do you fear this turning into an EAB type situation? As I'm sure everyone here is aware, we refuse to learn from our mistakes and have replaced all the parkway ash trees with red maples in too many places. Is there anything we can do to effectively break this cycle through federal regulations requiring diversity? I don't understand why we keep finding ourselves in this situation. Yeah, the monoculture approach is, hopefully we were able to break that uh, from, from repeating. Um, so do I, I think the first part of that question was asking if, if I see ALB, the ALB program becoming something like what we saw with the EAB program. Um, I'm gonna say strongly, no, I do not see that occurring with the main benefit or the main reason why I'm saying that is that ALB just doesn't fly as far. It's a much bigger beetle. And some people call it a, a lazy flyer. I know it can fly uh, several miles, um, but it doesn't, typically it, it, it doesn't want to. And when there's suitable host trees around, um, it just doesn't disperse as as far as as emerald ash borer did, and given the eradication, um, successful eradications that have already been demonstrated in Chicago and New Jersey, um, it we have a uh, we have a good track record there. And I expect eradication to occur in the other infestations as well. All right. Um, I know there has been some research in biocontrol of ALB. What progress has been made and what species or environmental factors control ALB in its native range? So yes, there is uh, biocontrol research underway. Our, uh, the Center for Science and uh, Plant Health Technology uh, group in, in Massachusetts have been doing that. 
they've sent, they've had researchers in ALB's native range looking for parasitoids and other natural predators and have tested them to see if they can uh, potentially be used um, or distributed in current infestations as an eradication tool. They've also looked at native parasitoids um, in the, in like Ohio, for example, <clears throat> uh, to see if, if those are something that could be bred, multiplied, and released into the current infestation to, to be used as a control method. Um, to date, there's nothing uh, ready for, for release. Um, and, uh, but they're still looking. All right, um, that's about the end of the questions that we have here. Uh, folks, I will um, also post um, Phil's email, email address if you have additional questions that you think of after the webinar here. Again, it is being recorded, and if you know of folks that would like to um, look at this information, it will be posted on the emeraldashboard.info website uh, later on. Um, and we also uh, wanted to say thank you very much, Phil, for this update, and we appreciate the time you've taken to give us an idea of what's going on with this pest. We do get quite a few questions. Um, even though it's Emerald Ashbor, I have gotten questions on my emeraldashbor.info website from people wanting to know if I can tell them anything about ALB. So now I can point them to this, um, and I appreciate it. So with that, everybody, thanks for your participation, and thank you again, Phil, and I'm going to close the meeting, and I'll, we will hopefully see you again at another EAB University webinar. Thank you very much.